What purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to implore my colleagues to act with haste on the critical energy crisis that is currently dragging down the productivity of our economy and bleeding our workers bone dry. My constituents are already weighed down by the heavy burden of taxes and regulations and cannot afford to pay the rising pay the rising energy prices that currently hinder their ability to invest and rebuild in our local economy in the wake of a global pandemic and the suffocating lockdowns that have absolutely ravaged our communities. They can no longer afford the inefficient and opaque decisions making on the, of our energy policy and strategic reserve by bureaucrats who don't know what it means to be unable to fill up their gas tanks, balance a monthly food budget, or sacrificing the miles they drive in search of baby formula for their children. On behalf of the constituents of New York's 3rd Congressional District, I urge my colleagues to join me to aggressively demand common sense energy policies to encourage due diligence and transparency from the decision makers and to shore up our strategic reserves for the sake of our precious national security. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Without objection, the gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to acknowledge that the 27th of January marks the anniversary of the Auschwitz concentration camp being liberated by the Red Army in 1945. Let this day serve as a reminder that we must honor the victims and survivors. We must also pay tribute to the liberators who rescued millions of people who nearly fell victim to the Holocaust. In fact, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the grandmother of one of my DC staffers who is a 93-year-old survivor of Auschwitz and is also one of the few survivors of her family who was tragically lost at the hands of Nazi murderers. Anti-Semitism is a plague in this nation and it is undoubtedly up to us to ensure this kind of tragedy is never to be seen again. This is a tribute to aging survivors and the Jewish community. We must guarantee access to the services they need to live long and dignified lives. This day and every day, we, gre we give credence to the dark side of humanity, but strive, to, but strive for a better, brighter future. I yield back. For what purpose does a gentleman from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor the brave men and women of the Nassau County Police Department. Last week, the Nassau PD arrested eight men in New York's 3rd Congressional District who are said to be part of an organized theft group from South America. While I am grateful to their ongoing commitment to preventing these acts of violence, but for suburban New Yorkers in New York's 3rd Congressional District, we are seeing a major uptick in crime. In Nassau County alone, a reported 7,394 crimes have been recorded in 2022. This includes grand larceny, burglaries, and vehicle theft. Recently, I spoke with New York, uh, with the NYPD's commanding officer assistant, Chief Kevin Williams of Queens, to discuss the potential protests in response to the unfortunate events that have taken place in Memphis. I would like to personally extend my support to Assistant Chief Williams and his team during this time of uncertainty. While peaceful protests may occur nationwide, we should also offer our support to the brave men and women of our local law enforcement. It is my commitment to support good policy that will provide both the training and resources that our local law enforcement requires to keep our community safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent to address the floor for one minute. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to congratulate my colleagues on voting to remove Representative Ilhan Omar from the Foreign Affairs Committee. The passage of H.R. 76 sends a strong message that we support Israel and the Jewish community. I urge the 118th Congress to now stand together, proudly upholding every single American, no matter race, pedigree, religion, nor creed, as any less American than their neighbor. 
that Jewish Americans are patriotic Americans and that we all have a role in fighting bigotry and anti-Semitism in our country. We must make sure that the House of Representatives reflects such principles as a united body. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise it. Madam Speaker, today I rise to honor a former volunteer fighter, fire, firefighter who was at Ground Zero on 9-11, Michael Weinstock. He was an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn Special Victims Bureau and a volunteer firefighter and an EMT. On the morning of 9-11, Michael witnessed the black smoke billowing out of the World Trade Center and without thought, he voluntarily rode with, his, with first responders to help in any way he could. Michael had been unloading medical equipment out of an ambulance when the South Tower crumbled and nearly crushed Michael to death. Today, Michael suffers from a painful and incurable disease, neuropathy. Michael has been a strong advocate for neuropathy to be covered by the World Trade Center Health Program. Neuropathy is a medical condition that results in damage to the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. Those who suffer from neuropathy experience weakness, numbness, which typically occurs in hands or feet. This can be incredibly painful and debilitating, and many are unable to live normal lives. This is also known as the suicide disease due to limited effective treatments and that there is no cure. Studies have linked neuropathy with the 9-11 dust, a study that was published by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. The data from 20, the 2019 study found that nearly 10,000 firefighters and emergency medical workers were exposed to toxins at the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center health program covered conditions categories include acute traumatic injuries, airways and digestive disorders, cancers, mental health conditions, to name a few. In 2016, the World Trade Center the World Trade Center Health Program was petitioned to add peripheral neuropathy to its list of covered conditions, which it declined to do. In 17, the FDNY responder again petitioned the program to add peripheral neuropathy to its covered conditions list. Unfortunately, the World Trade Center Health Program declined to update its list a second time, citing insufficient evidence. Michael's story is one of many that have yet to be told to a wider audience. This issue goes beyond the political pale of Republicans versus Democrat. As a member of the 118th Congress, I would like to use this opportunity to raise, to raise awareness of what the men and women who suffer from this debilitating disease due to the exposure of the toxins from the World Trade Center. Since the World Trade Center Health Program does not cover neuropathy, people like Michael must pay out of pocket for treatment, medications, and other medical needs. I ask my colleagues that we work together and find a solution and have conditions such as neuropathy be covered under the World Trade Center Program Act. Tomorrow I'm proud to have Michael as my guest for the State of the Union Address, and I'm proud to be his member as he is a constituent of the 3rd Congressional District. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. As for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to introduce my bill, the Salt Relief Act. My bill will increase the state and local taxes cap deduction from 10,000 to 50,000. By increasing the salt deduction is a step in the right direction to lessen the burden of combined federal and state local taxes during these times of economic hardship. New York has one of the highest tax rates in the country, ranking above, including federal, state, and local taxes. In 2018, for Nassau County, the average salt amount, property, tax liability income, or sales tax liability, reported amongst itemizing filers was $30,227,000.21. But due to the $10,000 cap, the average SALT deduction actually claimed $9,023.79. Let it be known that the SALT tax is not a tax break for the wealthy, but a tax relief for working class families. This is about the 118th Congress working to ease the affordability burden in high tax states like New York. While the cost of living continues to plague New Yorkers and by raising the cap salt tax will provide real tax relief, not just to New York's third congressional district, but to all in America. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I rise today for International Women's Day to acknowledge women in small business from New York's third congressional district. 
Pam Ocasio from Pam's Jams with a Z is a mom with a talent for curating unique homemade jams and marmalades from local ingredients. She is always at the local farmer's markets in Oyster Bay with a smiling face and a can-do attitude. Another Wonder Woman, Angela Carrillo, is a mother of two from Beth Page with an associate's degree in medical technology and a bachelor's degree in biology. She put her chemistry skills to test in her basement studio in 2010, curating beautiful and fabulously scented home soaps. I have seen her work at, a local, cra at local craft fairs around the district, and I must say, she certainly gives any major manufacturer a run for their money. Joey Bowen is a mother of two who built her business as a single mom. Joey lives in Bethpage and, ha and hand makes stylish, clear handbags. She started in her living room and expanded to an international operation. She now has storefronts around Nassau County and supports the local economy and the workforce. Cheers to all these women out there and for their extraordinary accomplishments. I yield back. For what, Mr. Santos, for 30 minutes? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honor the dedicated men and women of the United States Coast Guard sector, Long Island, located in NY3, that stretches from Eaton's Neck and just beyond Kings Point. It is one of the oldest Coast Guard stations in New York and the fourth oldest in the United States. They carry out humanitarian services such as rescue, they, they carry out humanitarian searches, such as search and rescue. They are marine time security, which is their top priority, along with port security. They are the law enforcement service branch of the United States Armed Forces, and the United States Coast, Coast Guard is the largest and most powerful Coast Guard in the world that rivals most navies. During 9-11, these unsung heroes evacuated some 565,000 people from Manhattan who chose the water route to escape NYC. In addition, their search and rescue ops increased by 35% since the pandemic with a 22% increase in fatalities. While keeping vigilant of our coasts, they also take the fight to gun, drug, and human smugglers out on the high seas. All their missions related activities is being carried out despite a $4 billion backlog in infrastructure, including the old station building at Eaton's Neck. Structural issues with the U.S. Coast Guard station in Saugerties, as well as flooding, mold, lead, and asbestos issues at each of the U.S. Coast Guard stations on the South Shore. Because of these conditions, the Coast Guard staff must clean up the basements late at night instead of getting proper sleep after handling search and rescue operations all day. As you can see, these are the conditions behind me of what the men and women who service our country honorably have to endure. While all of this is being carried out with about 100 reservists and 40,000 members, some of whom have difficulty receiving mental health services, being stationed at some of these facilities can become a long and lonely mission due to long winters and, can, and, and very little social life. Sadly, they are also pay and housing issues. Some U.S. Coast Guard staff are utilizing food pantries and have difficulties finding affordable housing within enough driving distance of their station. This results in a moral, morale and recruiting issue. Lastly, there are some 3,000 3, offshore wind turbines that are coming and posing a major concern for the Coast Guard when it comes to performing search and rescue. Their helicopters their helicopters op would have to carefully navigate a waterway during a rescue operation without getting caught up in the wind turbines, in addition to Coast Guard vessels having difficulties with their radar capabilities navigating in and around these windmills. I would also like to add 
that the construction of these turbines can take up to 15 to 20 years to build, resulting in an expe expected 1,800 transits up in the Hudson River from the port of New York and out to sea. This places a huge responsibility on the shoulders of the Coast Guard to ensure the safety of all those types of boaters and vessels. I, I highlight these concerns because they operate under a limited budget. They deserve proper pay, rest, housing, medical, as well as mental health. And above all, our sincere gratitude. These dedicated men and women are truly the unsung heroes of our military force who protect our coasts, protect our economic and secure security interests abroad, saving thousands of lives a year at sea. And providing emergency response to both man-made and natural disasters. The, the Coast Guard ethos are in service to our nation with honor, respect, devotion to duty, we protect, we defend, we save. We are semper partus. We are the United States Coast Guard. I thank the US Coast Guard for their dedication to protecting our coastal borders and keeping those at sea safe from harm. Madam Speaker, most of the world, mo most of us would, would take this, grant, this for granted and never think twice about the water we drink. We assume it is safe and that the contaminants have been filtered out. I am here to address the water contamination concern that is affecting communities within New York's third congressional district. The village of Farmingdale is an incorporated village on Long Island in Nassau County. The village is serviced by two different water utilities, the Village of Farmingdale Water Department that serves approximately 9,500 and the South Farmingdale Water District which serves approximately 45,000 residents. One of the water plants is already impacted by contaminants and the second is in danger of approaching contamination within 11 months. PFOS substances, which are commonly known as PFAs, are chemicals used for their waterproofing and stain resistance. They typically, typically can be found in a variety of products such as fabric conditioner, firefighting foam, and older styles of Teflon. They are also known as forever chemicals that never break down in water and soil and accumulate the the persist in human body, that accumulate and persist in the human body. Health effects from PFAs can vary according to the CDC. PFAs may lead to high cholesterol, increased risk of kidney cancer, liver problems, and disease in birth weight. Currently, the village of Farmingdale is trying to address these emergent, emerging contaminants, including one to four dioxin and P PFAs that are emanating from plumes in the aquifer from various hazardous waste sites outside of the boundaries of the village. The village is in the process of constructing and advancing oxidation plant, AOP, and granulated act activated carbon filters to remove PFA and 1,4 part dioxin compounds at this location. In reality is, in 11 months, 9,500 people in the village of Farmingdale are at risk of having no access to clean water if we do nothing about it. Unfortunately, these contaminants have already impacted one of the water supply wells located at Eastern Parkway, where the village operates a 1.73 million gallon per day well, as, uh, well, also known as well one of three. As a result, well one of three has been offline since July of 2021, and the village of Farmingdale has declared an emergency. In December of 2019, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation directed the installation of sentinel wells near the village of Farmingdale's boundaries, which is a short distance of approximately 1,500 feet of both water plants to monitor the toxic plume and the impact. A sentinel well is a groundwater 
monitoring well located between a known area of groundwater contamination and drinking water supply well. This pending contamination necessitates that the village of Farmingdale implement costly filtration system, systems not just for well one, but also for the two remaining operational wells, two and three. Farmingdale most recent Farmingdale's most recent sample indicates a significant increase in contamination concentrations of the two remaining operational wells. Concentration in these sentinel wells exceed the current standards. Concentration of 1,4 parts dioxin have risen from 1.7 ppb parts per billion in June of 2021 to 3.4 parts per billion in March of 2022. In 2017, a nonprofit known as the Environmental Working Group collaborated with scientists, aggregated and analyzed data from 50,000 local water utilities in all 50 states. For the village of Farmingdale, the group discovered six contaminants across the supply between 2012 and 2017. The following contaminants include corium, nitrate, 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 radium, arsenic, and radium. For the village residents, the business to have a safe supply of potable water, the village is pre preparing contingency plans, which will also have a significant financial impact on this small village. This is just one small community facing contaminated water, and unfortunately, they are not alone. While I am pleased that New York became the first state in the nation to adopt drinking water standards, but at the federal level, we should be doing more to invest in our water infrastructure improvement projects. Clean water should never be a luxury to any community. In fact, clean water should always be a right to every American citizen. Madam Speaker, today, I have to defend the taxpayers living in Nassau County. As Long Island becomes less affordable and inflation disrupts our everyday lives, Long Islanders are struggling to pay taxes. Our homeowners in Nassau County are now being required to pay an additional 2.06% in school taxes for 2023 through 2024. Nassau County ranks amongst eight counties nationwide with the highest medium property tax, which consists of 60% in school tax. One of the more affluent school districts in New York three, Jericho, is proposing a 2.77% tax increase. The district will pay an additional 2.6 million in health insurance, along with 700,000 more for public school bus transportation. This is why the taxpayers of Long, of Long Island would greatly benefit from my bill, H.R. 1360, the Salt Relief Act. All taxpayers need a buffer, especially during times of economic hardship. My bill is, my bill is designed to keep money in taxpayers' wallets while keeping residents on Long Island. I'm calling on my colleagues to co-sponsor my bill and consider what is at stake for all American families. I'd like to take the time to congratulate Emily Kim and Kevin Zhu of Jericho High School on becoming finalists in the 2023 Regeneron Science Talent Search. Both Emily and Kevin had the experience of presenting their research for a week in the nation's capital and were awarded $25,000 based on their research skills and promise as scientists. Emily and Kevin were chosen to compete out of 1,949 students from 628 high schools across 48 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and four other countries. Emily's project studied activated carbon and its potential to treat the wastewater produced by the fast fashion and textile industries. 
Kevin Zhu's project studied change in DNA associated with neurological disease and how the changes can serve as a measurable indicator for future cancer blood tests. And these extraordinary students, although very young, have set the bar for the many likely to follow in their footsteps. Now more than ever, scientific research and STEM skills are vital to solving some of the world's most complex problems. Bright minds such as Kevin and Emily's are the cutting edge of the breakthrough discoveries. Congratulations to you both and may you have a great success in the future and in your career. I'd like to congratulate the Manhattan Indians girls basketball team for their outstanding performance this, past, this month. On March 11th, they played an impressive game and what many argue to be the most competitive game all season. With just 70 seconds left and what appeared to be their certain defeat, the girls gave it their all and scored six straight points, including an astonishing free throw from senior grad Caitlin Barrett. Their junior forward, Lauren Perfetto, scored 12 points and grabbed 11 rebounds in what some have called the best game of her career. The girls tied the game at 45 and went into overtime, then wrapped the game with a three-point lead. With demonstrated composure, resilience, and teamwork, the Manhasset Indians set the bar in athleticism. I know that you work so hard, and thank you for making this historic mark in Manhasset's history. Keep your chin up, ladies. Congratulations to the Manhasset Indian girls basketball team. Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve in the House of Representatives, and it's an honor to represent the constituents of the 3rd Congressional District of New York, and to come here every day and fight for the interest of our constituents. I want to thank uh, the, 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 the speaker and the staff for all your work and for all the dedication to the American people. And with that, I'd like to yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are begging for a compromise, asking for our trust. We trusted that our children would be safeguarded from lewd content such as this book. I can't quote a page nor show a page from this book because it's against decorum for this body. Why is this appropriate in our schools? Here's the reality. We used to trust our educators. We trusted that our educators respected the boundaries of the home. We trusted that they would leave the rearing of our children to, to the parents. We trusted that the curriculum was not formulated by bureaucrats and that classrooms would not be transformed into indoctrination camps. We trusted that our school boards would respect children's parents and not rear to them as domestic terrorists when they voice their concerns. But we were let down. The Parents' Bill of Rights will put the power back in the hands of parents and provide them with the information they need to ensure their children receive the best education. Parents have a right to know what their children are, th are taught. Parents have a right to see the school budget and spending. Parents have the right to keep their children safe. And with that, I yield back. Okay, so that's done. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, the American people need tax relief. And I rise today to share my unapologetic support for the Fair Tax Act. Taxes continue to skyrocket in states like New York. Many of my constituents pay nearly 50,000 in local taxes. Of that amount, 10K can be deducted for gross income. The rest gets taxed twice. I've introduced two bills regarding tax deductions, H.R. 1260, the Salt Relief Tax Act, and H.R. 2634, the Alimony Relief Act. 
Both of my bills seek additional deductions for taxpayers forced to submit to government-directed payments. Regarding alimony, I hope to repeal the section of law within the Tax Cuts and Jobs Acts of 2017, which places the tax liability of government-mandated payments on the person who makes the payment and not the payee. Why should the person earning the money but not spending it pay the tax liability? Mr. Carter's Fair Tax Act ensures that we pay taxes on what we buy rather than what we earn and would make both my bills unnecessary. The hours spent every year doing tax returns wouldn't be necessary and Americans would have more time to spend with their families. I hope we can make real progress on the Fair Tax Act, but in the meantime, I would welcome my colleagues to support my efforts and I look forward to the day when a simpler tax code is afforded to our constituents, all of our constituents. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. At this point, Mr. Speaker, I would yield three and a half minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, the distinguished ranking member of the Committee on Rules, Mr. McGovern. The gentleman from Massachusetts is uh, recognized for three and a half minutes. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are about to debate H.R. 2, a horrible immigration bill that betrays our values, that hurts our farmers, that makes it easier to put fentanyl on our streets. And we're told it was rewritten in, the, in a back room in the Speaker's office. I have yet to see the rewrite. In fact, I haven't even heard a description of what was changed. And I want to say for the record, from a process standpoint, this is as bad as it gets. My friends should be ashamed of themselves. But wait, there's even more. Um, I, I wasn't planning uh, to speak today, uh, but I have to point out the ridiculous hypocrisy of what's going on. Republicans are here on the floor with straight faces, acting like unemployment insurance fraud is one of the top problems in America. They ignore billionaires who pay no taxes, but they want us to believe there's an unemployment insurance crime spree. And so here we are. They're going after farmers and veterans, after workers and families that needed help during the pandemic, while at the same time, a sitting member of the House Republican Conference was indicted in federal court this morning for unemployment fraud. Let me repeat that. We have a member of this body, a member of this Republican conference, a key swing vote on their debt ceiling bill, a key swing vote to secure Kevin McCarthy's speakership, who this morning was in federal custody for, let me quote this from the indictment, uh, uh, falsely claiming to be unemployed while he was making $120,000 a year. I mean, is this a joke? George Santos allegedly stole almost $25,000 in unemployment benefits. And here's the part that you can't make up. Uh, this is too absurd to be true, but it is. Their bill, their bill uh, defunds the program that catches people who commit this kind of fraud. I have a letter in front of me from the Department of Labor, which I will insert into the record, that says their bill defunds the program that helps them catch fraud. Now, maybe that's why George Santos co-sponsored it. Of course, he, of course he did. Um, if this becomes law, uh, maybe he would have gotten away with it. But I think we should rename this the George Anthony DeValder Santos Fraudster Protection Act. What's that old horror movie saying? The call is coming from inside the house. You're going after fraud, but the fraud is coming from inside the Republican conference. Deal with that. And here's the bottom line. The modern GOP has become the party of corruption and crime. It's all about power for them. They put their own power above the people we represent. Their front runner for president is a sexual abuser and has been indicted for his illegal hush money payments to cover up his affair. They won't denounce it. Their key swing vote was in federal custody for allegedly stealing unemployment benefits and lying to Congress, and they won't kick him out. They want to gut the Office of Congressional Ethics, and they want to make it easier for rich people to cheat on their taxes. And now they want to pass a bill that would make it easier for George Santos to get away with fraud. Forget honor, forget principles, forget integrity. All they care about is power at any cost. It is disgraceful, it is shameful, it is wrong, and I urge a no vote on this rule and the underlying bill. Time has expired. Five minutes. Without objection.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The U.S. Department of Energy and the FBI have affirmed that the COVID pandemic most likely originated from a leak of the SARS-CoV-2 from a Wuhan Institute of Virology. The deadly COVID virus was unleashed on American soil in 2020, yet it took three years and a new majority in Congress to finally start investigating the, the malign influence of the barbaric Chinese Communist Party. COVID was not the CCP's only flagrant and unsparring attempt to infiltrate American sovereignty. Earlier this year, spy balloons floated along the United States and gathered intelligence from sensitive U.S. military sites. Just last month, two CC CCP spies were arrested and 36 CCP police officers were charged with operating an illegal and secret police station in New York City. The two alleged CCP spies only to be quickly granted bail and released from custody. In 2020, leaked CCP member data confirmed that U.S. companies such as Boeing, Qualcomm, and Pfizer had employed dozens of CCP members in their Chinese facilities. Rightfully so, Americans are infiltrated, are infiltrated blaming ivory towers in Washington, D.C., and Wall Street for being slow to punch and handing our fragile dominion over to, to, to globalists. We ought to do better. We ought to protect Americans, and we ought to do to preserve democracy. This is why I'm unapologetically pushing back on the CCP and calling on the House Judiciary Committee, the DOJ, and the Select Subcommittee on Weaponization of the Federal Government to investigate the CCP infiltration on the U.S. government and do all they can to free Miles Guo. In 2017, the CCP, CCP's most wanted prominent critic, Miles Guo, claimed political asylum in the United States, alleging persecution by the CCP. He has been here for about six years, and just last month, Guo was arrested and denied bail for being pronounced a flight risk. In this case, the charges against Miles Guo are simply a part of an organized campaign of political persecution brought against him by the CCP. As a matter of fact, in November of 2018, George Hickenbotham, a senior official at the DOJ pleaded guilty to his active role in this illegal campaign. He admitted to accepting $41 million from the CCP and meeting with the Vice Minister of Public Security of China to advance the removal of Guo from the United States. It is with great dismay but complete confidence that I say that the weaponization of the United States prosecutorial system is spinning further out of control, and it is time we take a stand. It shows when we have a national crime crisis failing by the wide wayside because political motivated campaigns designed for nothing other than retribution on political agitators keep getting in the way of our leading law enforcement off officials who refuse to prioritize the American people. With each passing year, it is becoming increasingly obvious that the CCP is accomplishing its goal of infiltrating the United States indigenously and all, all the while perpetrators, the real threat to the American people are let out on the streets and harmless political targets remain behind bars with justice denied. Mr. Speaker, I speak for every American when I say we are done tucking our tails and being at the losing end of every trade-off with the CCP. They take our jobs, use our technology, and steal our intellectual property and it is turned we get robbed, spied, and deadly viruses. Enough is enough. Free Miles Guo. I yield back. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for the protection of freedom. While the circumstances that brought our heroes to combat vary, their sacrifice is the same. They died protecting their fellow soldiers in the foxhole, the skies, and the seas. We can never fully grasp the unique story of each of our fallen, but let us never forget the patriotic lesson that our nation's bravest remind us. Among them, we do not pursue freedom in support of the United States. We pursue the United States in support of freedom. On this Memorial Day, as the nation collectively pauses to remember those who've made the ultimate sacrifice, let us also contemplate what their sacrifice teaches us. The United States and its Constitution are more than a mutually beneficial agreement between the states. 
The final cause of our union is a universal principle of freedom. Many of our heroes lost their lives protecting the freedom of their friends, family, and neighbors. Others died in defense of freedom belonging to those they ne had never met. The sacrifice of our fallen servicemen and women, including thousands from the 3rd District of New York, reminds us of this. Today and every day, Mr. Speaker, let us honor the lives of our fallen military personnel and let their lessons guide our every decision as we move towards a free world. This Memorial Day, let's talk about that. Thank you, and I yield back. The chair Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In March, I introduced H.R. 1736, also known as the Equality and Fiscal Accountability Protection Act of 2023. This bill will cut off the cash faucet the U.S. government gives away to countries such as Uganda that persecutes, criminalizes, or discriminates against individuals based on their sexual orientation. Since June is Pride Month, I thought this bill would be a great way to remind the American people and this body that the best way to celebrate this, the history and achievements of gay rights is to stand up to countries actively oppressing the LGBT community. Many countries are light years behind everything we have worked for to be treated civilly and humanely in this country. In fact, many countries are still persecuting their citizens for the simple fact that they are gay. Uganda is just one of many countries executing and prosecu prosecuting its people based on their sexual orientation. However, they received hundreds of millions of dollars in 2022 alone from President Biden's emergency plan for AIDS relief or their PEPFAR. While waving rainbow flags and changing corporate logos is pleasant enough lip service and virtue signaling, we need to send a clear message that the United States will not offer federal aid to countries that habitually violate basic human rights based on sexual orientation. We as a nation have a responsibility to stand up for the human rights of all people, regardless of race, religion, or sexual orientation. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the... Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I rise to address a grave concern about our relationship with Brazil. This nation which holds non-NATO ally status with the United States has constantly undermined us in recent years in ways that warrant our undivided attention. Just recently, the former convicted criminal and now reinstated president of Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, known as Lula, hosted and praised the infamous dictator Nicolas Maduro from Venezuela. Lula's actions have legitimized a man who is currently sought by the U.S. Department of Justice for narco-terrorism, a man who, because of his alleged humanitarian crimes, cannot even set foot in U.S. soil without fear of arrest. In addition, Lula has publicly criticized the United States for support to Ukraine and has even suggested that our nation is purposely prolonging the war for commercial interests. This is the same leader who has actively sought to undermine the U.S. currency through their BRICS agreements with Russia and China and who maintain strong ties with the Chinese Communist Party. Mr. Speaker, Brazil is not a minority player on the world stage. It is the largest economy in South America, the 10th largest globally, and the fourth largest food producer in the world, the second largest producer of non-iron ore, and a significant player in the energy sector. It holds strategic importance in the Southern Hemisphere, a fact that the CCP seems to understand better than us. We should be working to forge stronger ties with Brazil, encouraging it, to, encouraging it towards dem democratic capitalist values rather than standing by as it deepens its ties with the communist and autocrat regime and around the globe. Brazil's growing alignment with the Chinese authoritarian government is already yielding dangerous impacts on its democracy. Even mainstream USA media outlets reports are showing an unsettling trend, a rise in state-sanctioned actions against free speech, a free press, and civil liberties in Brazil. Increasingly, the country's judicial system is being weaponized and censorship is on the rise. We must take decisive action to condemn Brazil's current engagement in suppressing civil liberties, its deepening ties with authoritarian regimes, and the serious risk this trend poses to Western democracy. 
As the first Brazilian American elected to this House, I implore all my colleagues to treat this matter with the urgency it deserves. It is a matter that affects not only America, but the free world at, at its whole. Madam Speaker, I yield back. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to talk about the FAA Reauthorization Act. Since before I was elected to Congress, my district has been afflicted by excessive aviation-related noise. I campaign on addressing this issue, and yesterday I gave testimony on my amendments in the Rules Committee. I'm following through on my commitment to offer relief to my constituents. If enacted, the changes I propose would lower the permissible decibel levels from 65 to 55, reevaluate the technology known as NextGen, and put up for questioning its impact to communities all around the United States that suffer with the issue of constant flight path. Since taking office, I visited with the people of New York's third district who have begged me to take action on this matter, often with tears in their eyes. Most people will suppose this is an exaggeration, but most people have no idea what it's like to live right next to one of the largest airport hubs in the country. I'm here today to make sure my constituents and many others around the country know they are not alone and their plight is not in vain. I urge this body to take these amendments into consideration. Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. New York, Mr. Santos, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to bring attention to the state of chaos okay. that the Biden administration border policies have created in New York's third district. Today at 1 p.m., there is a press conference taking place back home in front of the new megastructure tent being built at Creedmoor Center across the street from an elementary school, PS18, in Queens. You see, Mr. Speaker, when I visited the border just a couple of weeks ago, I toured a similar facility to the one being built in my district. Now it's safe to say what is going on at the southern border can be felt as far north as New York. This problem is no longer out of sight, out of mind, thanks to the Biden administration policies. All districts are border districts. I'm calling on Mayor Eric Adams to stop this madness and to declare a state of emergency for New York City and to stop taking in these migrants. The city is overwhelmed by constant influx of migrants alongside being plagued by rising crime. As the only Republican representing Queens in Congress, I call on my counterparts on the other side of the aisle to join me in efforts to end this madness in our county and in our city. New Yorkers deserve a, be a better quality of life than the one imposed by its one-party rule government. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. I'm from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Flight patterns have become a silent threat to the health and well-being of Americans. One might ask, what, what does that have to do with this amendment? While well, citizens of, of New York's metropolitan area and the con continental United States are ceaselessly burdened by aircraft noise and pollution. Residents in NY3 have been begging elected officials like me to support mitigation efforts to give citizens plagued by ceaseless noisy skies and polluted skies a reprieve. Taking aim at the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Polly Throttenberg, is not a punishment, but rather a wake-up call holding her accountable for her inaction. By reducing her salary to $1, we send a strong message that the well-being of Americans should be at the top priority, not the convenience of a select few. Mr. Chair, but the, flight, the fight against harmful flight patterns doesn't end with Polly Trottenberg. We must also demand transparency, accountability, and the comprehensive review of flight patterns across the country. It's time to put the health of our communities first and ensure that every decision made in the aviation industry reflects our values. Let's work together in this body, Republicans and Democrats alike, to make a real difference in our communities. For years, NY3's constituents and communities just like it have asked for help and now I would like to put it in the record and let it be known that a no vote is a vote against accountability for the people who allow millions of Americans to suffer under the arbitrary rules of the Department of Transportation, FAA, air traffic control, to name a few agencies. I urge the adoption of my amendment to set a new tone and to have accountability for the people suffering from a lack of leadership on this segmented issue of our decaying transportation infrastructure under this administration. I reserve. 
Gentleman from New York Reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I claim time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized. Just to reference the last statement made, this is a first generation, first administration in my lifetime that has passed a comprehensive infrastructure bill uh, of this magnitude. To suggest that uh, it's going the opposite direction, support while supporting a bill that guts much of, much of that effort belies comprehension. Um, I, I sometimes wonder what people will think in the future uh, and they ask us, you know, dad or granddad, what'd you do in Congress? You know, if the best you can say is, I cut a dedicated public servant's salary to a dollar because I disagreed with them. Ms. Trottenberg has an extensive 25-year-plus public sector career in all levels of government, including stepping up to serve as acting administrator for the FAA to help ensure this country and our global partners could continue to rely on the safety of our national airspace system. We, again, should not be punish, penalizing public servants who are representing the administration they serve based on policy disagreements. I can't imagine our founding fathers thinking this would be a good idea, but it's, I guess, the new normal. It's no reason to support this amendment. I encourage my colleagues to oppose it, and I reserve. The gentleman from Illinois reserves. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Chair, my colleague from across the aisle, huh, he speaks uh, with honesty, and I, and I believe so. Uh, but I will say this, um, to, call, to call it a public servant, a bureaucrat, I think that's disingenuous, and the American people are sick and tired of us considering people who fail at their jobs continu continuously to continue to keep their jobs. I think it's cutting back uh, bad government. I think it's holding government accountable, and I think it's holding people who are inept. Ms. Strottenberg's time as acting FAA administrator was abysmal, with very little accountability, with very little done. So I stand strong that I think we should adopt my amendment, uh, and I reserve. The, uh, I yield back. The gentleman from New York uh, yields the balance of his time. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized. It's clearly our responsibility to hold people accountable. Um, there's a number of ways to do that. Call them to testify, question them all day long, say whatever you want in public within reason. But it's quite another thing to make it so they can't do the job because you're only paying them a dollar a year. It's outside the realm, the barriers here, of what we're supposed to be about. At some point, we went outside the norms. And, and I've come to believe that norms are almost as important as the Constitution. <laughs> you don't treat people this way. The Constitution, they, you couldn't imagine that we would do this to each other. So they had that foundation that's so critical, and the laws uh, almost as critical. But I'm starting to believe that the way we treat each other is the most important norm. And if we can't act with a simple baseline sense of decency and respect, that nobody's going to work for a dollar a year. And, you, and respectfully, you're just messaging and insulting other people and disrespecting the dignity of this House. We can and we must do better. I oppose this amendment. Does the gentleman yield? I yield. Gentleman from Illinois yields. The uh, question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Ms. Chair. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ms. Chair, Illinois seek recognition? I respectfully request a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York will be postponed. It is now in order to consider amendment number 74, printed in Part B of House Report 118 to 261. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment.